Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Welcome to a brand new video In today's video, we're going to continue on Reading about uh, Continue on regarding the ending of Mark We're going to read from the Hermeneia commentary here On Mark by Adela Yabro Collins And if you not watched the video where I, I read From the Anchor Bible commentary Then please watch the, the two videos that I've made and so we're going to go and read about the ending of Mark. This is page 797. Okay. Um, this is a commentary up until verse 8. We're going to go to the next page. Okay. About verse uh, 9 uh, onwards. Okay. Robert H. Gundry argued that verse 8 in the autograph of Mark was not the conclusion of the pericope that began with verse 1, but in the beginning of a new but the beginning of a new unit, the rest of which is now lost. Okay. He gives twelve uh, arguments in support of this hypothesis. In the tenth argument, he acknowledges that the sentence, paragraph, or section may end in gar, right? For for which is uh, okay. He argues, nevertheless, that no other book has gar as its last word, mentioning plot. Um, for example, he quotes here E N N. I think it's the N yet, five point five as a possible exception right or maybe the word end here in verse 5 uh, um, chapter 5 verse 5 I, need, I don't quote me on this one I need to check on what this is with reference to an article by P.W. Uh, Van der Horst in that article Van der Horst took the, the position that if a sentence can end with gar a book can end with such a sentence as an example he pointed to the above mentioned text the 32nd treatise of Plotinus uh, Plotinus as edited by Porphyry right the, e the yeah the Enneads 5.5 which ends with Gar following uh, our harder he acknowledges that treatises 30 31 32 and 33 constitute one large treatise but there is evidence that these treatises were originally four separate lectures on the same topic. The lecture in question, presented as a distinct treatise by Porphyry, ends as follows. For that which acts is better than that which is acted upon. Right? For it is more perfect. And Clayton Croy concluded that the most significant analogies to 16.8, Mark chapter 16 verse 8, are the Plotinus passage, or Plotinus, depending on how you pronounce it, and the twelfth essay of Musionus Rufus. The latter concerns sexual indulgence. This short essay, or fragment of an essay, ends with a question that and ends with a question followed by a short statement. What need is there to say that it is an act of licentiousness? Nothing and nothing less for a master to have relations with a slave. Everyone knows that. Croy also noted, as others had before him, that a work attributed to Demetrius on epistolary types ends with Gar, but he found this fact deceptive, since the final sentence, for I am in your debt, is actually the last sentence of a sampler letter of the thankful type. Croy argue, argued that a book could end with Gar, but concluded that the rarity of sentences ending with that conjunction in narrative prose and their extreme rarity at the end of narrative works makes it unlikely that Mark originally ended with 16.8. That means he's trying to argue here that 16.8 is not the ending of Mark. He suggested that the narrative went on to relate the action of the woman who reported the news to uh, the other disciples. The lost ending contained at least one resurrection appearance story. Located in Galilee and focusing on Peter, Kelly Iverson has argued persuasively, however, that the argument from the infre infrequency of 
final ga. In narrative literature, does not make it probable that 16.8 is not the original ending of Ma. In light of the evidence, it seems best to regard verse 8 as the original ending of Mark and to interpret the additional endings as products of later times. Okay. The alternative is to argue that, number one, the author was prevented from completing his gospel. Number two, that he did continue after 16.8 but that the continuation was lost or detached at an earlier date. These hypotheses have already been refuted decisively. And for example, uh, Lightfoot in his uh, book Gospel, uh, I think it's an article, right? Gospel Message, uh, pages 80 to 85. Um, this is in German, I can't read. Right. I mean, this is in English, but this is the Schluss de Mark Marcus and Van Gelliums, 455 to 61. I just butchered that one. <laughs> the issue of the rel relation between verse 8 and verse 7 in the Eastern narrative of Mark has also been important in the interpretation of verse 8. Bultmann argued that in the present form of Mark, the statement they said nothing to anyone in verse 8 implies that the woman did not carry out the angel's instruction because the angel tell them to uh, tell the woman to tell the disciples right but the woman did not carry out that that instruction so to speak but he rejected the conclusion that this implication was the original meaning of the empty tomb story and thus ver of verse 8 bookman here rejects this Further, he concluded that the original ending of Mark must have uh, recounted the appearance of Jesus in gallery. Must. Right? Meaning, Bookman expect this to be. The evidence led him... Oh, sorry. The evidence led J.M. Creed to argue in the opposite direction. According to him, verses 7 and 8 contradict each other and no consistent continuation of the narrative is possible. Thus, Mark must have ended with verse 8. What is needed, however, is an interpretation that makes sense both of both verses 7 and 8 in their present context. Before the issue of interpretation can be addressed, a few more philological or stylistic details should be discussed. With regard to the issue of the concluding sentences ending with for, okay, which is the Greek word gar, it should be noted that the Gospel of Mark includes many explanatory comments linked to their context with this conjunction. As we've surveyed um, uh, Joel Marcus's writing, right? He also argued along this line. Since these, this, since these comments follow the statement that they are explaining or elaborating, the force of this observation is that the use of this conjunction in 16.8 does not require any continuation of the narrative to fulfill its role in the context. Some opponents of the thesis that verse 8 is the original conclusion of the gospel have argued that the verb they were afraid is incomplete as it stands and must have been followed originally by an object, an infinitive or a clause introduced with the conjunction. Right? Apart from 16.8, the verse to be afraid occurs 11 times in Mark. It is used with a personal object 4 times. Now it's arguing uh, along the line of the grammar here. Once it is used in the phrase, they were very fearful, literally. Right? The translation here is, they feared a great fear. On one occasion, it is used with the infinitive. They were afraid to ask him. Right? This verb is never used with the conjunction. Okay, uh, may, that, or not, or less in Mark. It is used five times or absolutely as in 16.8. In each of these cases, the cause of the fear is at least somewhat ambiguous. This is especially true in 10.32. Okay. In 16.8, however, the cause of the fear is clear from the context. It points backward, not forward. In the first part of the verse, it is clear that the trembling and amazement that seized the woman were caused by what they had seen and heard in the tomb. This, the, disappearance of, the disappearance of Jesus' body, the presence of an angel, and the announcement that Jesus had risen from the dead are events that go beyond or even contradict ordinary expectation, meaning if you don't accept the supernatural, right? Y this will contradict that contradicts contradicts the or even contradict ordi ordinary expectations and experience. 
the second part of verse 8 and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid continues the description of the impact that the experience at the tomb had on the woman their silence is a result of their being struck with awe at the extraordinary events the tension between the commission given by the woman by the angel in given the woman by the angel in verse 7 and the silence of the woman in verse 8 is due to the depiction of the overwhelming effect of the overall experience on the woman the, the text does not address the question whether the woman eventually gave the disciples and Peter the message. It focuses rather on the numinous and shocking character of the event of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So let me just stop here and summarize because there's a, there's a lot of uh, technical terms here being used or is sometimes it's very hard to follow. So basically, when just like when we read um, the Anchor Bible, Right, commentary by Joel Marcus, he was stating it clearly that a lot of people has tried to has tried to argue that uh, th um, the the ending of Mark with the Greek word gar for right is very very strange and peculiar and most likely uh, this is not the original ending. But just like Joel Marcus, Adela Yabro Collins have tried to argue that no, no, this is actually not peculiar at all. This is common to Mark. And so those who expect that the ending of Mark is definitely not 16.8, meaning they, they, are, they are probably not familiar with the Markan Greek. Right? And so, for example, if you read this text in English, the translation, right, it might seem strange because none of the <laughs> the modern English writers actually wrote something like this, right? So this is the num number one false analogy that we are not reading the original text, and sec and and secondly, sorry, firstly, you are not reading the original text in Greek, and secondly, you are anachronistic in your perception, right, in your views, uh, so forth. And thirdly, you have not actually studied or learned the uh, or read Mark in Greek enough to know that there is actually this peculiarity in his writings, right? So because if you read in English the translation, they tr always translated it to like good English, right? They they won't translate it to like they won't translate literally, I even though the ESV and the R NRSV is can be so called literal translation. But they're actually not literal at all, right? Because they do need to follow English grammar, they do they do need to follow all these uh, rules or and so forth, right? And so because of that, um, they have to construct it in a much uh, readable sentence sentences that make sense, right? Even though the NRSV is much better than the ESV at you know trying to make the sentence make sense right ESV there's just a lot of redundancy but that is just how the Greek is so ESV is can be considered much more literal than the NRSV right in in from what I have gathered right um, and so the first argument that there's many peculiar that the ending is uh, definitely 16.8 is because the peculiarities are common in Mark's Gospel. In fact, this is the peculiarity in his writings and also the peculiarity in his, in his stories, right? The Messianic secret, for example. So there's a lot of peculiarities in Mark's story uh, as well. And also um, here, a lot of people thought that there must be a continuation uh, because the other Gospels had it or have it but again um, the focus here is actually not on the resurrection of Jesus the focus here is not about the story of Jesus and the disciples after he is being raised from the dead the the focus here is actually about the woman right about the impact the fearful impact here that um, the empty tomb suggests it's not even resurrection right for those of you who claim that Mark has a resurrection um, this is actually not true right uh, because Josephus have mentioned before uh, Josephus did mention in his work that there are people that are crucified but they are they did not die right they were crucified but then they were actually brought down 
right? and they were still alive. This is Josephus, first century historian, first century of the common era historian. Right, so the the resurrection, because we are so familiar with the other gospels, right? So we we want to harmonize with the other gospel, right? So, but then people would ask, why would they lay him at a tomb? Right, there could be a couple of explanations. Right, so for example, if you try to think of it historically. He he wants to like Nicodemus save him, uh, or whoever save him uh, from from the uh, from the what you call it from the stake from from the cru crucifix, save him, and then they want to hide him away, right? And so, what is the best way to hide him? Right, is to put him in in an empty tomb. The 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 empty tomb here is not the place where um, the dead people would live for, uh, forever, right? No, the Jewish practices is that they would actually lay the the body in the tomb, right, and then let it decompose, and then they would actually put it in an ossuary, right? They would put in it is like a bone box, and there's a lot when if you are familiar with biblical archaeology, there's a lot of ossuary um, found. Right, and so this is where they would lay the bone, right? They, and the empty tomb is just to lay the body there for it to decompose, and after that they will collect the bones, and then they will put it in an ossuary, right? So that that is the Jew Jewish uh, burial practice, right? And so a lot of people thought that they were, they built an empty tomb, and and then that is where the dead body stays uh, for the rest of it, of its <laughs> miserable life, right? For example. Um, no, no, they will, they will actually put it in an ossuary, right? And so it could very well be, if you look at things historically, that he was brought down from the crucifix, right? Jesus here was brought down from the cru from the the stake, and then he he was given, you know, he was taken care of. His wounds were fixed, uh, so on and so called, right? And then they were um, the the people. Uh, the man, right, it's not an angel, right? A man at the tomb mentioned that oh, he has been raised. Right, it it could mean a, a lot of things. He, he has been raised from the dead, or he has been raised. Basically, he was helped up and so on and so forth. Right, whatever your your interpretations may be, right. But the text in itself doesn't really suggest that resurrection is the only plausible explanation. Right. And so, this interpretation is supported by primary text within and outside of Mark. Okay, meaning here uh, the the events of the raising of Jesus, right? Meaning the raising of Jesus, or the 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 event whereby Jesus had been raised, or the event that Jesus is no longer there, right? His body could have been stolen by thieves, <laughs> like some of these scholars, right? Very supernatural scholars. The the very super non uh, the non supernaturalist scholars, right? So this imputation is supported by primary text we did and outside of Mark, meaning the the resurrection that okay, Jesus has been raised. In the account of this uh, stealing within. In the account of the stealing of the storm, the disciples are presented indirectly as having an ordinary fear of the storm when they uh, when they wake Jesus and say, "Don't you dare! Don't you care that we are perishing?" This is uh, Mark four thirty eight. When Jesus has put a stop to the storm, however, they experience a different kind of fear. They are terrified when they see Jesus, whom they presume to be an ordinary human being, act with divine power. Furthermore, a reaction of amazement or awe is typical of the responses of those present to the mighty deeds of Jesus. This kind of reaction is related to the typical human response, response to a theophany or epiphany. Right. Like human beings, we, human beings has divine qualities or divine power acting on human beings. Right. Depending on how you look at it, a good example of overwhelm, awestruck flight in response to a divine epiphany occurs in a hymn to Demeter by Callimachus. 
Kelly Marcus or Kelly Matches or Kelly Marcus. Demeter disguised as her priestess warns a youth to stop cutting down her sacred trees. Rather than deceased, he defies her. But Demeter was unspeakably enraged and took on her godlike shape again. Her steps touched the ground, but her head touched Olympus. Well, when they, when they, the young man and his servants saw the goddess, they start started away, half dead with fear, leaving their bronze implements in the trees. Okay. And this is him six. Okay, him to Demeter. Uh, him number six or book six. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with this work. In Greek literature, fear is a common reaction reaction to divine epiphany. In biblical literature, the appearance of an angel is analogous to the Greek divine epiphany. Right? Gundry, following and citing C. E. B. Cranfield, or Cranfield, argued that it is highly improbable that Mark intended to conclude his gospel without at least one account of resurrection appearance since resurrection appearances were part of the early Christian charisma, This type of argument was already well refuted by Olaf Linton. One can observe a progression from Mark to Matthew and John to, Acts, to Luke Acts to apocryphal Gospels. Okay. The earliest tradition about the resurrection, resurrection link it in this indissolubly with the exaltation of Jesus, for example, in Philemon, Romans, and Mark 14.62. Later accounts of the resurrection appearances began to imply that when Jesus rose from the dead, he had returned to a bodily existence much like the one he had before his death. Okay. This is interesting, because if you know about Paul, like every resurrected body is a spirit, but Jesus returned to his ordinary body, flesh. right? The apocryphal gospels and related texts elaborate at the beginning and the ending of the story of Jesus as found in the canonical gospels more than the account of his ministry. Furthermore, Luke X distinguishes between the resurrection of Jesus and his exaltation explicitly by narrating his definitive ascension to heaven, for example in Acts 1, 9 to um, 11. Let me just take a sip here. Right. For the author of Mark, writing near the beginning of this process, the tradition about the appearances of Jesus did not seem to be an integral part of the story of Jesus. <laughs> this is interesting. Like many, the story of about Jesus is not the main. It's not the main uh, narrative of the gospel, right? This gospel, even though it contains Jesus as as the character. Right or the appearances of Jesus, right, did not seem to be an integral part of the uh, story of Jesus, right? Meaning it, it, it is, it is not the main thing that the author of Mark wants you to know. Okay, like the other gospels, John, for example, right? The author of Mark, his main narrative is not the resurrection of Jesus. Right, it's about the other teachings of Jesus. This is already clear from the predictions of the Passion which mention his death and his resurrection, but not appearances. A shift in focus can also be noted. Oops. A shift in focus can also be noted in the charisma as summarized by Paul in 1 Corinthians. Right. I think I spilled water on my how did I spill water on my book here? Never mind. Okay, by Paul in 1 Corinthians. The first part focuses on Jesus and it is the predicates that change. He died. Right? He was buried and he rose. In the second part, the focus is on those to whom the risen Jesus appeared. The predicate stays the same. He appeared. And it is the indirect objects, objects that change. Right, and it goes on giving example. I think this is, you don't need to read this. The explicit making of sequence in the list of appearances. Okay, again, another example. Paul's concern to include himself in the list implies that such appearances 
at least in the case of certain individuals, endowed their re recipients with authority in the early communities of those who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Mark drew the line that is ended his gospel after the first part of the kerygma. He rose. Okay. So if I can summarize, if I can interpret this midrash, right, meaning midrash is an interpretation. So I'm making a midrash of the midrashim. And so basically what it means is uh, this person is trying to say, this, this scholar is trying to say is that um, it can also be said that when Mark contradicts Paul, right? Paul's story about Jesus is all about his resurrection. What Jesus does after his resurrection, maybe Mark don't believe that. If you take the narrative that Mark actually knew Paul, right, that means Mark disagree with Paul, or Mark do not see the importance of of narrating the resurrection appearances of Jesus, just like Paul has or had, right? Because in Paul's writing, I'm not sure what text Mark is familiar with Paul's writing presumably the seven authentic Pauline epistles so it means so what it means is that um, Paul do not agree uh, Mark do not agree with Paul about the resurrection uh, appearances of Jesus as being the main thing right which is could be the reason why Mark never actually included this resurrection appearance in his account so this is something interesting to, to note as well because the as I've mentioned not only Paul but the other gospel authors probably influenced by Paul believe or don't believe or don't agree with Mark that how come Mark never actually include the the resurrection appearances of uh, Jesus right and so they could very well agree, or having been influenced by Paul, the other gospel authors, right? Regardless of how many they are, they probably say that okay, hold on a second, Paul is our, right? Paul is uh, the apostle of Jesus, right? According to Paul, right? No one else. And so probably these these uh, these gospel authors, they are probably influenced by Paul in Christianity, and so they want to add the resurrection story at the end because Paul's narrative is all about Jesus and him crucified and right? that's what he he, he wants right? in Corinthians he, that's what he say I, I came to know nothing else except Jesus and him crucified right and, and so which is why we have the the uh, this is also difficult to argue this way because the Gospels are made out of ma multiple different sources and there's no way to actually establish that the gospel authors, the, the the first author of these gospels, right? If you take the view that John has multiple views, and if you take right, majority of people would actually take that um, the gospel authors, you know, they're probably written by one author, right? But there are people who actually suggest that the gospel authors, uh, apart from John, right, the synoptics also contains several different writers and this is actually can be argued as well because if you take if you count that different sources equates to different authors and so we know that Matthew and Luke use different sources and so they can it contains within their gospel different authors that they probably quote but never cited Right. So in in modern sense, if you are writing a thesis, right, you are the one that actually writing the thesis. But then you have all these different books and resources that you use, right, and so you just take them and put in your writings without citing them. It is as if it is your own work, right. And so you you can look at things uh, that way. Mark drew the line that is ended his gospel after the first part of the kerygma. He rose. Right? The author of Luke X drew another kind of line after the appearances to the twelve. Up to that point, the appearances are bodily. Thereafter, right, meaning flesh, there Jesus, Jesus walks on and so forth, right? Eat broiled fish and honeycomb. Right? Whereas this the 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 
probably the gospel authors, the synoptic authors, are aware of Paul's uh, resurrection narrative, and also about what Paul, what resurrected body meant for Paul. And so the authors of the gospel disagree with Paul, right? Because according to Paul, every resurrected bodies, a uh, body, is spirit. Is spirit is a spiritual body. And then the gospel authors, I can imagine them saying, "Ah, I disagree with this." No, so we have to put Jesus ate honeycomb and broiled fish to to show them that this is actually what resurrected body actually is, like flesh, right? Flesh, like physical flesh, right? Let's let's pause here. And what is the Islamic view about the resurrected body? Right, the Islamic view about the resurrected body is actually not the view that Paul proposes. Right, it is that we will be, like Muslims believe, that we will actually be um, raised to the bodily, uh, to the f- to the flesh. Like our bones will form, our skins will all form again, and we will become a physical body, just like what the Gospel authors is trying to say. So the gospel authors, if you want to look at things that way, uh, their interpretation of what a resurrected body is is much closer to the Islamic views, and so and it's also much closer to the Jewish views, <laughs> and so I don't know where Paul get this idea from, right? Resurrection, resurrected bodies, at least for the Pharisees. The Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, by the way. And a lot of Jews today do not believe in the resurrection, right? Uh, because Jews have a view of Gehenna, but that is where the the dead souls would be, right? If it, we can interpret it as an underworld, right? And so, again, th- it's very difficult because uh, if you want to look at things from the past, and you want to look at things uh, from a modern perspective. There's a lot of interpretation, different interpretation. Right? For example, the Sadducees do not believe in the re- resurrection, but that doesn't mean that they do not believe that they will be raised again. Right? That doesn't mean that they do not believe that they will meet God or they will, you know, come back to life in in whatever way. Right? Um. I, their view is different from the atheists. Atheists believe that once you die, you're dust and bones, and that's it. Right? You cease to exist. That's it. Right? So they don't believe that there's such thing as a soul, so on and so forth. So this is the atheistic view. And this is not the Jewish view. This is definitely not the Pharisaic view. Right? This is a modern view. Right? Actually, not modern, because even the pagans in the past, you know, they, they, they believe that once you die, you cease to exist. Right? Moving on here, the evangelist alludes to the appearance in 1428, talking about Luke here, and 167. Oh, sorry, talking about Mark here. He did not need actually to narrate one or more appearance accounts because he wrote for an audience that knew the, the tradition about appearances of the risen Lord from the oral proclamation. As argued above, the young man is best understood as an angel and probably was so understood by early audiences. Thus, his prediction or promise that the disciples and Peter would see Jesus or experience a resurrection appearance in Galilee can be taken as reliable. How exactly the appearance would take place even in light of the woman's silence would probably not have been an issue and John became widely known that the ending of Mark seemed deficient. It was this new perception that led to the addition of further materials after 1608. Okay. The conclusion that I will explain after this, the conclusion that Mark ended with 1608 is supported by the emphasis throughout the gospel on the numinous or numinous or on the human response of wonder to the manifestation of heavenly power in an earthly context. Okay. And so, I mean, there are, there are more here. These are the translation. 
but the the now it goes to dis discussing every single uh, passage, right? And so basically, to summarize, just as Joel Marcus had uh, commented in his uh, Anchor Bible series, yeah. peculiarity of Marcan gospel or Marcan writing or literature is is something that we is something that should not be a factor in deciding whether 16.8 is actually the ending or 16.8 is actually not the ending. In fact, Mark's gospel, the gospel of Mark is so peculiar, right? It contains a lot of narrative that are different than the uh, other synoptic gospels. And also because the literature or the language that Mark uses Remember, the Markan Greek is not as good as Math the Matthean Greek. And so because of this, we, we cannot actually, and also because of the Mark uses a lot of this quote-unquote strange kind of way to end the text or to include them in the text, right? It could probably be because um, that's just how Mark is. That's just how he write his gospel. Right? And so to argue that because it is so peculiar, so strange to end in 16.8 and uh, that is more of a modern perception of how a narrative should end right. in fact if you want to think about what it means to be peculiar you should look at the ending of John 20 and 21 it's just like John says that right this is it and then he continues <laughs> <laughs> he continues so that's what led scholars to believe that chapter 21 it was added later on and that's that's what led scholars to believe that 69 to 20 is, is a much later edition and so there's consistency when it comes to literary criticism or narrative criticism right and so anyway ladies and gentlemen we end our survey here obviously when I say end right we've only looked at one side of the literature We've looked at the Anchor Bible and we've looked at the we just finished looking at the Hermeneia commentary. We can explore evangelical literatures obviously. We can explore you know like monographs and it's better to go to monographs because commentary is something that I, I comment commentaries are not monographs. Monographs are are detailed study, very very detailed study of a very particular topic. For example, the resurrection sixteen eight to is sixteen eight the ending, right? And so the entire book is basically about trying to argue whether sixteen eight is actually the ending or sixteen eight is not the ending, right? based on the literature review, based on the survey of Greco-Roman literatures, or so on and so forth. Right, so that is actually a monograph. It's more like a thesis, right, your PhD thesis. Right, so that, that is how whereby you the field is so narrow, right, because when you're doing thesis at that level, is the, f the things that you need to engage in are so narrow. Right, so, and so those are what monographs uh, really are. Whereas commentaries are books that basically not discuss the passage or the idea in details. Right. So a lot. This is something that I want to clear up because it's when I watch all these different videos on YouTube, right? They think that they can just go to the commentaries and they'll find the answer. No, commentaries just give you a summary of what the monographs really is for that different topic. Right, it is a midrash. It is, it is, it is not the pashat. Right, it, it is the the like you are just you are not proving a text or you are not proving a case. You are taking the conclusion of the case and then just put it in here. And so when you read commentaries, you basically just get the conclusion. But how do the scholars actually? How did the author? of the, the, the quotation the cite, cited works actually got their conclusion it is done through the the monographs right 
Am I confusing? <laughs> Hopefully I'm not confusing. So well whereas it is actually good to look at the commentaries, but I would actually recommend you look at monographs. <laughs> Cambridge has the most famous monographs you can basically find on any topics. Uh, you can find on textual criticism, you can find you know, on any topics. They have a huge range of monographs, right? Monographs of the New Testament, Cambridge University Press. TNT Clark has as well. TNT Clark, uh, but TNT Clark is more. I would say they they're more theologically influenced, right? They're not really. They don't really play by the historical based on what I've I've read, right? They they don't really play on the historical rules so much, right? Whereas the monograph by Cambridge are those that really really stick to the historical uh, historiography, so to speak, right? I would recommend the Cambridge monographs of the New Testament. You can find on any topic. I have a a couple of them on textual criticism um, whereas it is, it is a very technical um, studies right, because it goes into the Greek so on and so forth and you have to actually go to the Greek grammar and actually look at the Greek grammar to understand what they are saying right we get a little bit of that uh, I skip mostly the, the, the Greek section when it comes to the grammars and so forth, right? But Adela Yabro Collins does as uh, argue, right? The Greek of Mark is also peculiar, and so we shouldn't say that uh, it's weird to end with ga. The word in Greek means for. So he, she goes and explain along the lines and so forth, right? And so I s I skip uh, uh, that pericope, right? That that part that portion. Um, and so, the Hermeneia commentary and the Anchor Bible commentaries does require you to actually read Greek, right? Um, also, know a little bit about Greek grammar, the aorist tense, and so forth. Right, and so, it's very different from English grammar, wher whereas Greek grammar you have something that is like happening for so long. Right, and it is just one tense. Right. For example, in English, you want to descri describe something in the past, you say past tense. Right, in in the future, you say you know, even though we don't use future tense, <laughs> right, right, and the present is present tense. And so there there are moods in Greek grammar so and so forth, and so it's very difficult to actually follow along the Anchor Bible and as well as the Hermeneia co Hermeneia commentaries. If you're not familiar with number one, if you do not know how to read Koine Greek, right? If you do not know a little bit about Greek grammar so on and so forth, right? You you do not need to know a lot about Greek grammar. You just need to know the basics, the the fundamental, the understand the the how do you call it? If just so that you, when you read the text, you know what's going on, right? And you know what is the definite article, so on and so forth, so, so on and so forth, right? Because Greek has a very special rule wh whereby the noun is always attached to the definite article. For example, in Greek, y you you will have, if I translate to English, right, um, the Galilee, the Jesus, some something like that, right? The Paul, the Apostle, so it always has this definite article it can come before and can it can come you know de depending on, on the, the context and the arrangement of the words are also different right you can ha in English subject and then the object right you in Greek you can have the object first and then the subject later on right and then you need to know the link uh, which one is the subject which one is the object anyway Ladies and gentlemen, while I let my book dry, 
because I don't know how I spill water on it. I'll see you on my next video. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.